All right. Good evening, everyone. I am Brian Pontalillo. I'm the editorial director at Fine Home Building and Green Building Advisor, and I am thrilled to welcome you to tonight's webinar uh, about on the topic of um, smart and um, flexible uh, home design. And I'm here with architect Tina Govan, who I have um, we were just uh, wondering if we've actually ever met in person, um, which is an interesting question. It, it always seems to feel like you've met people in person who you've worked with so much. But Tina and I have worked um, together um, for quite a long time now. Um, Tina has helped out with content for fine home building in a number of ways. Um, by, by way of an introduction to tonight's um, to, to tonight's topic and to, to Tina, really, more importantly, introducing Tina, I, I just want to note that um, I'm an architecture enthusiast, and um, some of my personal preferences um, and interests in architecture include uh, the intersection of modern design with the, the warmth of more traditional architecture, um, the simplicity and clean aesthetic of uh, Japanese styles, um, and the integration of form and function, which maybe that sounds obvious when you're thinking about architecture, but the truth is that all too often today, um, those things are, are not integrated in residential design. And why I bring up my preferences is because Tina's work really has always spoken to my preferences. Mm -hmm. And so whenever uh, we looked at one of Tina's projects, I was always excited to get it in the magazine. And what is even better is when you have a, when you, as a magazine editor in this field, when you have a preference towards uh, a stylistic preference, and there's also really good information because the, the design is so thoughtful that you can make great content out of it. So it's been really easy to work with, with Tina over the years and, and a pleasure. And she's written stuff for us on, you know, uh, using really small additions to, to make a, an older house work. She wrote a great article on, on a $40,000 kitchen remodel that was just, that was dynamite. And um, she won our Editor's Choice Award. Um, one year for a, a, a really fantastic uh, modern farmhouse that was made with this neat uh, built with this neat masonry material. So um, I'm gonna I'm gonna encourage Tina to talk a little bit more about her uh, her um, professional bio as she as she gets going here. Um, but I wanted to I just wanted to give a little bit more of a personal introduction. And and, and Tina is by the way the um, she is in Raleigh, North Carolina, and her studio is called Placemaking Studio. So with that introduction, before I hand it off to Tina, just a couple of things about how the night is going to go. Um, after I hand off to Tina here, I will disappear from the screen and Tina will start her into her presentation, which is the heart of the evening. And um, after, when she finishes, which we're, we're planning on about 45 minutes or so of presentation, we'll have 15, 20 minutes for Q&A. And so I'll come back on and, um, and I'll help um, take questions from the chat. You can use the chat as the night goes on. You can drop questions in there. And I will try to pay attention to what you're asking throughout the evening and jot them down um, and save the most relevant questions for Tina. But um, it, it's also helpful if you save your questions towards the end so that they don't get buried in the chat or feel free to re-ask them, um, re-ask your questions at the end. So um, one more request. We had a really, um, of you, of the audience, we had a really excellent um, turnout for a webinar for us tonight um, and lots of interest in this webinar. So I would love it if anyone who felt inclined would drop a note in the chat um, just telling us what was so intriguing to you or intriguing enough to you to be here about um, about this topic. Um, we'd love to learn a little bit from you on that. So without any further ado, um, Tina, welcome. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much, Brian. It's great to finally see your face. And um, I'm really honored to be here tonight. I'm excited. Um, I, uh, I like Brian said, I'm an architect. I've had, had been principal of my own firm here in Raleigh, North Carolina for close to 30 years now. And um, I've been doing a lot of residential design, but also uh, public space and community projects and kind of placemaking. And what I've come to realize is that actually my approach to residential design is really related to placemaking as well, sort of allowing homeowners to make their own place. And hopefully that'll be evident 
tonight as we go forward. So we're, let's get on with small, flexible home design, doing more with less. So um, <laughs> when I approach people about trying to reduce their square footages, they, they say, well, what do I do with all my stuff? Well, you know, myself included, we probably all could do a little Marie Kondo on what we own and make sure that what we do have is what we actually use. But after you go through that process, one of my suggestions is to make walls out of your stuff. And I'll show you what that means. You know, you can actually make thick walls where you store things and have that enclose your spaces rather than making separate rooms. So here are some examples. Here's an, uh, an entry cabinet that is a um, coat closet that defines the entry hall from the living room. And then in, on the left is a low wall that with just a little bit of extra dimension can hold cups and napkins and jars it, that also defines this, the um, separation from the living room beyond. So walls don't have to be just, you know, two by four drywall walls. You, they can actually work for you. And uh, here they are getting even fatter. So this, this is actually a, a, a pantry that's a cabinet that helps define the stairwell, sort of a railing for the stairwell on the right. And, but it serves a pantry for the kitchen on the left. And then the, the, the left photo is showing a um, cabinet that you know, defines the foyer, but it's also the laundry room. So, we can we can really use our walls and they don't also have to go all the way up to the ceiling you can sculpt them you can make them partial walls and um, so I, I, a lot of what i'm going to be talking about is rethinking your walls and your enclosures and really making them intentionally designed make them work for you and make them give you the kind of enclosure that you want that's appropriate so here is another example um, where we're sort of using every available cavity in this house. This is a stair going upstairs and we wanted to use the cavities underneath the stair. So from the hallway, it holds pot pottery and linens. And on the other side, it's an office and it's holding stereo equipment, CDs and books. So you know, we're stuffing our stuff in these walls. And the other thing I wanted to point out here is the pocket doors. So that's another kind of trick that I really love is that when you do the pocket door, the door disappears. It's as if there isn't a door. And not only is that good for, you know, ADA accessibility, but it also is great for blurring that public private boundary. So these look like, you know, cased openings, when in fact they're doors. So when the door comes out, they become closed. So that kind of flexibility is really useful in a small house. So here's a drawing actually done by Fine Home Building on the left showing how this stair works on both sides, where it's got laundry on one side and stereo shelves on the other. So we actually snuck a washer dryer in there as well. So the laundry room really happens in the hallway. And this is an idea that I uh, propose to many people trying to reduce square footage is that, you know, rather than having an extra room, on, like on the left, you know, a lot of people say, I need a walk-in closet, or I need a laundry room, or I need a pantry that I walk into, which is fine, that can work, but you're actually adding square footage because you're adding circulation space within that room. and you know, you're going to be using the hallway and the circulation space anyway, why not use it to access the storage and access your laundry, access your pantry. And that way the, the hallways and circulation does a kind of double duty. And that's the case here in this laundry where you, you could just see it as a wall coming in if the door were shut. But when they're doing laundry, it can even spill out into the hallway. So the so the the hallway can actually become the laundry room depending on what's going on. Here's another instance where this is the entry hall for this modern house, but the entire hall is 
made up of sliding doors floor to ceiling. And when you slide them back, you get this generous access to this laundry area. And on the right, they've got mechanical equipment and a toilet. So this hallway, you know, sometimes it just looks like a paneled hallway and other times it could be full of laundry or, or something else, but you're really making that circulation work for you rather than making separate rooms. So that's, that's really um, saved me a lot of space with designs. And this is, these, these photographs um, kind of show several aspects of, I think, small home design is that, you know, again, here's these uh, cabinet of, of, uh, the, of um, books, you know, these bookshelves that are making the wall between the study, this is an office, and then the living room beyond. And again, we, we sculpted this so that it was just the right amount of separation and then gave another degree of flexibility by inserting a shoji screen between the bookcases. So the person, the woman who has this office, she can decide whether she wants more privacy, visual privacy and pull that shut, or she can open it up, talk to people on the other side, but it also adds this light axis, this axis through the house. So she gets view and light from the other rooms. Those views in, are shared between the spaces if she wants to do that. So just that kind of, of opening up big dimensions within the house or closing them down. But again, what's key is giving the control to the homeowner. And the another part of this, um, uh, strategy in this house was these are all eight foot ceilings and you all may be familiar with Sarah Suzanka or Frank Lloyd Wright who often use that strategy where um, you know but most people will say a, an eight foot ceiling is too small it's got to be at least nine feet but it's not if you have a seven foot shelf so we we experience space relative to other spaces so if you're coming in on a seven foot shelf or lower ceiling and it pops up to an eight foot ceiling it doesn't feel like eight feet, it feels like nine or more. So you can use those kinds of tricks to um, make, make the people's perceptions be different from their preconceptions. And um, another, I think, real difference it can make in a room uh, in a small house is opening up the diagonal. So if you open up the corners, it really explodes the space out in a way that putting a, a window in the middle of a wall doesn't. It expands the space. Like here's an, an example of a window in a wall. And even though this is a small space and, and it expands it through that framed view and brings in sort of a Japanese way, brings a distant view in to be intimate with you, it doesn't really, explode the space the way a diagonal opening will. So there's something about opening up the corner that is very dynamic and the movement on a diagonal is also uh, does the same thing, where it just really um, connects you to what's outside in a way that poking a hole in the middle of a wall does not. And another um, uh, kind of tactic is introducing big dimensions in, into, the, into a house with smaller rooms. So if you have a small house and things are, are rather tight, if you can find a way to introduce some big dimensions and that will make that house feel uh, more spacious and it will give some relief to the people who are in there. So, so anytime you can line up windows and views to the outside, um, that really helps expand the feeling of spaciousness in a house. And again, as you, I said, no, I'm a fan of pocket doors. And if you have these pocket doors that can disappear, then you can open up these kinds of long dimensions in a house more easily. And, and like in this case, this is you know a view through a bathroom and a shower, which is not typically uh, public, but uh, you could take advantage of that view when the when the bath isn't being used, and and it can make that that house feel more spacious by if you've you've got this you know glass door. And so you get to share that with the rest of the house. So, you know, again, I, I, trying to break the idea that some things are private, some things are public and, and thinking in terms of solid walls, giving yourself the um, opportunities to really open up in different ways. 
So um, he, this is a the house that um, the remodel that Brian was mentioning, the forty thousand dollar remodel, and it was a typical kind of ranch house where the kitchen uh, was sequestered in its own room. So you know, again, breaking down these the room mentality about spaces. So you can still um, distinguish spaces, but you don't have to distinguish them in a hard way. So the, the, the key to making smaller homes feel bigger is softening those boundaries. So we took down this wall, which was on the left, a very hard definition, and um, it opened up and made the, not only the kitchen feel more spacious, but all the spaces around it, the dining and the living feel bigger. You're still clearly defining these areas, but you don't need these floor to ceiling walls that are so hard. So this is my house and it sort of brings all of these kind of ideas together. We, this was a um, 1923 bungalow that we lived in that was under a thousand square feet. So it's four of us and a dog. So we definitely needed more space. So we made an addition and we knew that it was going to have to work hard. So uh, we, this is, we had lived in Japan. And so this is our master bedroom. And I don't want, to, want you to pay attention in this little corner um, over here on the other side of the steps, which is the laundry quote room. And then this is uh, uh, the bathroom past there. So again, this idea of blurring public and private, um, this, we wanted to add, we needed to add a bedroom. We, we didn't want it to be this block where we couldn't see into the backyard and to make the, the rest of the house feel more closed. So we decided to go with a tatami room where we have shoji screen that open up when it's not a bedroom and um, closed when it is and the futon goes under the window seat. Now I know this isn't something everyone would buy into, but we had sort of gotten used to it by living in Japan and it worked for us. And in the same way, um, blurring those, those public private boundaries is that this is a, a hallway again through a bathroom. So we needed a bathroom, but we didn't want it completely closed off. So we have this sliding door that closes when people are using it but then opens up to the sauna and hot tub in the back when they aren't. And you get this view out as well. So you share that view with the rest of the house. And we, and on a micro scale, this little niche of a laundry area, you know, normally you wouldn't have a laundry room in the same space as a living room, but because we have this sliding panel, you don't even notice it, that it's there. And it, so it can coexist with this living room, take up much less square footage. And we just slide it down, access this uh, washing machine and the, the hampers on the other side. So it basically just takes up a little three by three slot in a niche on the side of the room. And this is the um, spilling outside to the hot tub and sauna. So here's this the view of the, the whole addition. Uh, we've got this, there's a lot going on with the dining room in this niche and then a stair to the loft which um, makes a lowered ceiling over the office. So this again is a great um, drawing by fine home building. And the, you can see all of the different functions that this 600 square foot addition accommodates. So it's got a loft study upstairs with attic access, the, the home office down below, then the living room in the center, the dining room in this niche, this, this kitchen, which can also be shut off with pocket doors, uh, the laundry nook, the bathroom, which is also a hallway, and then the tatami room, and then all of it spilling outside. So there's a lot. It really works hard. It really earns its keep. And it has to do with, I think, the, sloth, the soft boundaries and the flexibility and the way the spaces are defined, not, again, as is hard rooms and we're using level changes a lot as well. So the tatami room being up higher and the lower ceiling under the office room and the loft up there. So they've all got different spatial characteristics, but they're softly defined. And this, uh, it works hard even, even more when we, when we change it up and have parties and different occasions. So sometimes we have the dining in this nook and other times we switch it up and have the living room there and then bring the dining table out in the big room with the Christmas tree during holidays. Or so, we also have a fold up ping pong top and it can become a kind of rec room. 
Here it is with, with the shoji shut, you can see. And then we've even had concerts there. And the loft is great for the audience and, and the tatami room. We've had uh, several performances there. And then when my kids were young, they would often have uh, friends over for Nerf gun wars. <laughs> so it's really been inhabited in a whole range of different ways, you know, from when my kids were born all the way up till the present day. So it's, it's, it's been very accommodating for all these different uses. And that's one point I really wanted to make tonight was this idea of divine, designing for capacity of spaces rather than you know, single use function spaces. And the, you know, I've always thought about spaces in terms of the different ways they can be inhabited by the homeowner and testing out scenarios over time. So in terms of the time of day, you know, how you might use them in the morning versus the night or the time of year or, or you know, for different occasions or when the weather is good or the weather's bad, when it's cold, when it's warm. And then, you know, over the years of your life, and so, you know, hopefully a, a, a house that's well designed is going to stay with you your whole life. You don't have to go through the effort of um, buying a new place, living somewhere else. And all of this has to do with not only having a physical, but a carbon footprint that is, is smaller, a physical footprint that's smaller, but also a carbon footprint that's smaller. So um, th this, this issue of time, designing for change over time, is something that's often not looked at. And it, it, it really matters what kinds of dimensions the rooms are as well. You're really designing a kind of stage set and for people's daily routines. And one of the problems I see people come to me um, with, I, I call it constipation, but it's basically um, these rocks that are in a house, like the laundry or the mechanical or the bath, the plumbing are in the wrong places. So they may have a great backyard, but they can't get to it because the mechanical room is there and or the or the garage is on the southern side of their house. So it's really important to think about these rocks in terms of where they sit, because they're going to determine the flow of the house. And typically they do better on the insides so that you can expand and relate to the outside and grow. You're more free and, and you have access to to light and view and you know the world outside and you keep the rocks on the inside. The same is true at the room scale where usually you have closets and bathrooms and stuff on the interior of the house so that it the room can open up to the outside. And I wanted to talk for a minute about furniture and lighting flexibility. So this is a house I designed where they wanted this um, small dining room to have many different uses uh, according to who was using it. So they, they've got a, um, a, a hanging light here that allows the table to be right up against the, the window, but then it can swag over to a hook and bring the table out and it could be used as a buffet. And then we've got an open end to this um, little niche of a dining room so that this table can extend basically the whole length of the house for uh, holiday dinners. So it's really been great for them to be able to accommodate all kinds of scenarios. This is a similar kind of situation where we had a special dining table made. Um, one, it, it broke into two. So this, this is a, uh, a place, this is for a retired couple for a, a breakfast nook. And then on the opposite end of the room, there's a larger table for sort of um, nightly dinners for the two of them or when they're with friends. And then they both can come together in the center of the room when they have their, um, their kids and their grandkids over for holiday dinners. So it, all in this one room, it can co accommodate you know, different ranges of people. And the, and the lighting does the same. If you have um, the tables on the ends, you can light only those lights under the lower shelves or it can come together and, and be lit up in the middle of the room. So this idea of flexible boundaries on the inside, it also applies to the outside, between inside and outside. This is a house where the, you know, the, the um, this breezeway, the walls 
fold away and suddenly the back and the front are connected and it becomes almost like two separate buildings. And then there's even more choice that it offers. I mean, it really expands and contracts with the seasons. It can, it can be um, completely open when weather's good. And then it has a screen that pulls down um, to make it a kind of screen porch if there's bugs out or it can close up completely and be glassed uh, in, in the winter. And another part of this same house, there's a, uh, a porch that the house spills out onto with the same kinds of features, you know, um, the boundaries themselves can be flexible and offer choice. So you can come out and just have it be an open covered porch, or it's got these um, automatic screens that come down and make it into a screen porch. So I've done that several times. This is another example where we had um, sort of in a Japanese style, we had glass panels that slid into pockets and then it became, and that left a screen wall. But during the winter, when it was colder, uh, we'd pull it out and it would become more of a sunroom. And this is a house uh, designed by my neighbor, Tom Berry. He, he um, added this screen porch and deck on the back of his house, but he wanted it to do more than, than just be a screen porch. He wanted it also to be flexible. So he designed it so that they had um, screened panels that were held in place by pegs and could be taken out and stored on top of this storage cabinet. And then it becomes a part of a deck that's covered and part that is open. And he can have friends over and parties that, that occupy the entire deck and flow from one to the other. Or he can choose just to have the screen porch. And this is a house designed by architect Frank Harmon, which again has a kind of exterior skin and walls that work hard. It's in the Bahamas. And so when the weather's good, all of these flaps and sl sliding panels open up. But when there's a hurricane coming, it closes up tight, like a tight box. So it's really responsive to the weather and um, storms that are coming. This is a, um, a small kind of little ranch house where they had a wonderful backyard or, um, or wanted to, and they had very little access to it and they felt trapped inside. And so we added a kind of sunroom onto it and it now it, it, the house opens up to this space and they're allowed to really dwell in their garden. And, um, and they love it. They really have, it's a relief to them to be out in the, in the yard and, um, Again, the, the walls of this space offer even more choices. You can, you can slide all these panels up and have a screen bottom or a screen top or slide them all down and have a sunroom and have it be all closed. So it's, it makes it so the room is you know, uh, usable all year round. So I really wanted to make the point that um, so much living can be done outside and that and to encourage everyone to inhabit your whole lot inside and out. Um, and you know, whether you're living in a small apartment or a small house in the woods, how your home relates or opens up to the outside is really critical to how it feels and how it performs and whether it feels claustrophobic or too tight or, or not. So we really need to break out of our homes because it greatly expands our homes if we break out of our boxes. You know, there's been, there's so many homes I've seen where that there's just no way to get outside or the connection to the outside is so poor. And so the house feels claustrophobic. And in order to have um, the outside really work for you, having easy direct access is really critical. If you have, you know, too many steps between inside and out, or if you have to go down a hallway and take a turn to go outside, then it's not going to work nearly as well. So it's that clear, direct access outside. And you can really double the living square footage of your home when you really take advantage of that outside space. This is a house that really takes advantage of every square inch of the lot inside and out. They occupy every level of this lot, climbing up through the house and even coming up to the roof deck. And that's a whole nother kind of living room up there. 
This is on my street, the Martin house. And in designing this house, I realized that if you have direct access to the outside and easy access, you can get away with much smaller square footage inside. So these bedrooms here are less than a hundred square feet, but because they, the front one opens onto the porch and the back one opens up to the outdoor terrace in the back, they feel much bigger. Just knowing that you can go outside expands that room so much. It really becomes part of your room. It extends your living space. So you feel much more freedom um, when you pair the inside square footage with outside square footage. And this is that's the kind of um, attitude I took towards the design of this house, which is in the mountains, but it's still very pretty small. And then the back, this is the kitchen, dining, living room. It's like a big porch opening onto a patio on uh, one side and then a wonderful screen porch on the other. So the, the, the kitchen spills out onto this porch, which runs the length of the house and then connects to the master bedroom beyond. So if you make a wonderful sort of uh, indoor outdoor space like this, it's great if you can connect it to as many interior spaces as possible so that they all get the advantage of being able to spill out onto it. So this really changed having this generous porch really changed how they live here and how they feel here. This is a house that is in a dense neighborhood in downtown Raleigh and it's squeezed between um, its neighbors. You can see they're very tight. And so, uh, but again, we are really trying to work in um, outdoor spaces in order to expand this house. So we've got this mid-level outdoor uh, terrace or deck, and, um, and then we've got them cascading down the sides. So there's actually a place uh, at street level where these folks can hang out, then they can walk halfway down to this uh, deck here that also has a door to the inside, and then there's one further down. So we've got this sort of necklace of outdoor spaces, and it's great for parties, and it's great for them to spill out. They can climb up through the house inside or outside. So here is the space outside by the by the street. Then you you can pass by that, go down through this sort of tunnel into the the mid level deck, and then on down to the bottom. So there's so many places to be in this house, and it's because we took advantage of the outdoor space. So these spaces between inside and outside, like porches, are flexible and critical for small homes, and you know they knew that back in uh, in the day, though uh, people are not building porches as much as, as they used to. And I really see them as a kind of lungs of the house, you know, a kind of soft zone um, where the house can expand and contract with seasons and with uh, occasion. The house itself, the interior heated square footage um, does not have to be that great. As long as you have access to these outdoor spaces and it can and you can spill outside and this same idea applies to apartments or multifamily housing or anything as long as you have access to some outdoor space it really makes a difference uh, i've designed some apartments that are very small and just having a balcony is huge in terms of how people feel when they use the space inside and it allows you so much more choice. And I think choice is also key to making smaller houses feel bigger. When you have control and you can decide where to be, you're not just trapped and have to use it one way or the other. And these soft, also just one last, these, these, these soft boundaries, rethinking these walls so that they're permeable and not hard. So these indoor outdoor spaces become outdoor living rooms or whatever you want them to be. They, they can change. They can really reflect the personality of the homeowner um, in the neighborhood I live in. They're occupied in all kinds of different ways and it's wonderful to see. And it is a kind of placemaking. It's how I, I see placemaking uh, intersecting with home design is uh, people make their place there and it changes over time. This allows people to spill outside. They can they can um, decide they, their homes live bigger. They can decide just to bury their nose in a book 
or they can decide to have a conversation with neighbors. Suddenly there's all these different zones between inside and out that you can be in. You're not just in or out. And so the house lives bigger. And during COVID, these kinds of spaces have become really critical. You know, they've been lifesavers with all of us trapped inside um, and being quarantined. Having these kinds of lungs and spaces to spill outside have been um, critical to people keeping their sanity and also for people connecting with each other. In my neighborhood, we've had all kinds of sort of safe social connection happening because we have a pattern of porches in our neighborhood. And, and, I, and people who don't have this kind of outdoor space, I think, um, suffer. I've seen porches in my neighborhood used in all kinds of ways during COVID, you know, everything from dining to exercising to play spaces for kids to even outdoor concerts. But when, home, you, this, when you see homes that don't have them, you see the missed opportunity where they don't recognize the value of outdoor space and they don't use it as well as efficiently as they do indoor space. And so, you know, you've, you've got this property and yet half of it is not even being exploited or used or enjoyed. Uh, and you, you know, can feel trapped inside. I think it's that kind of soft in-between space. It's really critical to bringing people out. And, you, and you, it's, this is a stark example of, of uh, the opposite. And lastly, I, I, when you do spill outside um, and, and you're in a dense neighborhood or maybe you've got a small lot, I wanted to mention the power of screens, fences and walls. And so if you, when you put up these kinds of screens, you really, can take better advantage of your lot. So you may have uh, close by neighbors or cars, and if you just camouflage them, then suddenly they're erased, and you can you can use um, the other side of them as if they weren't there. So we this is a house I did uh, in Durham where this this screen really kind of erases the car, and this becomes a garden, and you don't even know it's there. So these walls, you know. Um, really make a difference. Uh, you know, in, at my house, my neighbor is 10 feet away, but because we have a screen, we're completely unaware of it. And the car is just right on the other side of this fence. So it really al allows you to use the space right up to the fence. Whereas if the fence was not there, then you wouldn't do that. If the neighbor was there or the car was there, you wouldn't be comfortable being right up against the fence. So ironically, fences can actually make your, your outside feel bigger and they help to find outdoor rooms. And even five feet of space can be used well. This is a five foot space between the house and a property line and it's got tomato plants growing there and this is an outdoor shower. And you can have plants and beautiful stuff happen. Just It's just between the house wall and a fence, a property line that's five feet away. So there's really no reason to think that any square foot of your property should be wasted. And I really don't see you, my home as stopping at my exterior walls. I, you know, you can take it all the way to the property line so that, that you're, you, you inhabit your entire lot. And it also can bring nature close. So that's my dog. <laughs> and this is a bird feeder outside my desk. But you really can, a lot of life can enter in to that little uh, five foot space between your house and the fence. So um, sort of in conclusion, I would just like to, to uh, encourage you all to inhabit your home inside and out fully and in multiple ways and make it your own. Um, like Maya has, is doing here, uh, on this day, she's visiting the circus right in her house. So she's I, always has a different setup on her porch, doing something different. And um, it, 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 it's, a, it's a big house to her and she makes it really do what she wants it to be in, in uh, 
I think that's what porches and outdoor spaces are for. And I think that is, it. that's my last slide. All right, thank you so much, Tina. That was really excellent. And it, it was it was some of these projects I was familiar with, but it was fun to kind of revisit them and, and hear you talk about them more, a little, a little maybe more casually than when we're, you know, making a, an article about them. So um, I, right. I love hearing you talk, especially about your, um, about your, your home. And I did, yeah. I did drop in the chat for anyone who is um, curious about uh, more of Tina's work. Uh, I put some links in the chat um, so you can find uh, her, her articles on our website. Um, and so we have some time for questions. So please, please, um, you know, drop some questions into the chat. I'm going to, I'm going to pull some out of there, but I already do have some, some really excellent questions. Um, and so I want to start with, um, if you can contextualize a little bit, this this was asked really early on, and I almost interrupted you and and asked you asked you to talk about it then, but it's, I decided to wait. But okay. um, could you contextualize a little bit small and size so people know, like you know, when they start a design, and a lot of people here commented that they are going to be designing something soon. How they should sort of think about square footage from the from the beginning of a project. What is small? Is that it? Is it is it important? to think small and, and how do you think about square footage? Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's hard to quantify. I mean, um, I do use, I, I can refer to myself and, 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 uh, and say that, you know, we have uh, grown up in this house. It's a, it's a 1600 square foot house, uh, the four of us. And uh, that may be tight for some, but I really do think it works well because of how it spills outside. Um, and I think uh, what I have seen over the years is that um, people will have, have a certain, some, some people will have a fear of, of things being too small. And they think, okay, I'm gonna design my house. I've gotta have plenty of space. I don't want it to feel too tight. And, and can often err on the side of, of big uh, as a sort of safeguard. And I think it really um, makes sense to try to be careful not to do that um, and, and to design well and, um, and and not try to just it, it blow it up a little bit just for like the sake of making it bigger, just to be safe, you know? So I, I think that's, that's a kind of um, fear I've seen in people. Um, I think what, what really helps is to actually take out a tape measure and, and, and tape things out and, and refer to spaces that you already know and test things out that way um, and, and kind of realize that. I mean, I've, I've had a lot of homeowners um, come to a realization that, oh yeah, a dining room can be only, you know, 10 feet wide or, you know, it, 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 get, get a measuring stick out, a tape measure and, and measure your furniture and walk around and you'll be surprised at how, how little space you need for a lot of things. And I think also just designing in for growth is a good idea. I mean, you can always start out small and if you design it in a way that you're allowed to expand over time or it might change over time, then that's, that's another sort of um, tactic to take. But um, I, I think be brave and, 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 and get it to fit, fit you and not too much slack, because um, often a smaller space is more comfortable. Yeah, um, thank you for that. That's a, that's a thoughtful answer. And um, and I think that, that, you know, especially, you know, in terms of media promoting this kinds of content, like small needs context, I think, you know, and everyone's interested in small for good reason, but I think it needs, it does need context. Um, so I thought this question was interesting. From a cost point of view, do do, do some of these things that you're you're talking about, especially early on, you know, all the built-ins for storage, uh, pocket doors, um, how how do how do they compare versus adding more square footage to a house? Because clearly those things have a cost associated with them, but so does adding more square footage. Um, right. Um... I, I think uh, they're cheaper. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I think, you know, cause when you, when you add more square footage, it's, it's more of everything, you know, it's more roof, it's more, um, 
maintenance, it's more exterior materials and footings and you're, you're losing exterior space as well. And it's heating and cooling and, and, and the ongoing, you know, conditioning of that space. So um, I think, uh, I think trying to, to make it work for you and, and have things built in thoughtfully um, will really pay off in the long run over, um, you know, just making things bigger and making more rooms. Uh, and people really appreciate that kind of thoughtfulness. I think the, the kind of ma making more rooms and making more square footage is, is kind of the usual that you run into. Yeah. So, so I think I think it's it's well worth it to try to, to do built ins that, that uh, work for you. And pocket doors are not uh, any more expensive. I mean, you have to plan for them, but they're not an expensive um, feature. I mean, in fact, um, I have to say, unlike a lot of architects, I really made an effort to serve people with just ordinary incomes. And I'm actually really proud of the fact that that that. Um, these were not big budget houses generally. Yeah. Someone uh, just to stay on pocket doors for a moment. Um, they do have a reputation for being problematic and someone asked about that. So do you have any advice on either um, choosing, you have products that you particularly like or anything that you talk to builders about when it comes to making sure that pocket doors work? Yeah. Um, I, I think it's just Johnson. Is it Johnson and Johnson? Is that the, or no? Is that a or is it Johnson Hardware? Johnson Hardware, yeah. Johnson Hardware, okay. So that's that's what I've used, and it's not um, anything special. I think it's just having a good builder. Um, it, I, I've never really gone for there. Are, there are higher end hardware you can get, um, but I've always just used that, and uh, haven't had a problem with them. Yeah. Okay. Um, someone asked about the, the, when you were talking about, um, the flexible boundaries between spaces and you showed some examples and, uh, someone asked if there, if you've had any concerns with, um, or complaints maybe about sound transmission when you have flexible boundaries as opposed to walls. Right. Well, I think you, you do have to have some spaces that do have walls <laughs> and, um, solid walls. And so you, but I think what makes too many houses feel small, smaller than they need to, is that it is all thinking in terms of those solid walls. So opening up your thinking about, hey, maybe it doesn't have to be a, a solid wall. And maybe if I had options here, um, it could be used in all these different ways is what I'm trying to advocate for. But uh, for sure, you know, you do need solid walls and private rooms as my teenage son's have made clear. And so they had, they have rooms that with doors that shut and, you know, so that it, it just depends on your situation of, of how you separate, but um, it's, it's worked well for us, but um, of course you have to have both, but some, some kind of mediation of the kind of separation, you have your relationship to what's around you um, I think is, is missing from a lot of, houses, especially in public spaces. So when I talked about the addition onto my house, what's very cool, I think, about it is that we can all be in that space and also be separate. You know, we can be in different parts of this sort of general common space, and it's all defined by little niches, but um, but we're but we're separate. We're just, we're defined. We're, we each got our own little piece of it to be in. And um I think we need more of those coming together spaces in homes because I've had so many people say to me, you know, they have this big house and everyone has their separate room and they need an intercom to find out where the kids are or where people are. Mm -hmm. And there's no real place where they can all be together, but don't feel like they're on top of each other or, you know, so I think um, that's, that's a great thing to have in a house, but of course you need privacy um, as well. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I, there are a bunch of people, I want to take this question, make sure we take this question, because a bunch of people, when we asked what they came for, said that they were they were planning on designing their own home soon. And so they came here, you know, to learn. Um, and so 
given the fact that a lot of people said they were planning on designing their own home, I, I wanted to ask you the question, how important is it um, for people who are designing their own home to also consult with an architect? Hmm. Um, yeah, if they can find a good one. <laughs> I mean, <yeah. laughs> no, they're, they're good ones. Um, but I think... Um, uh, it, I think it is helpful. Yeah, I think it, I mean, it's obviously very helpful. And uh, I, I think the challenge is um, sometimes it's hard to get a consultation with an architect. You know, they, it, it's often that architects um, take a project from the beginning all the way to the end and it's, it's all or nothing. But if you can, if you can find um, someone to consult with, I think that can be really helpful or maybe do a schematic design um, because once it's built, you know, it's built. <laughs> so yeah. it, it's a pretty, you know, serious act. And so um, it, it's, it is really good to talk with someone who's got um, some experience and, and could really change your thinking about things and open up possibility. Mm -hmm. So um, if, if at all possible, yeah, it would be good to talk with someone or a house designer at, at a minimum um, because it does really, it is a kind of expertise that's sort of built up over time. And um, yeah, so I would, I would recommend a consultation if you can find someone to do that. Um, so we had, a, when you were talking about uh, making use of outdoor spaces, we had someone ask, um, do you have any tips for making a small home feel more spacious when connecting with the outdoors isn't a possibility? Um, well, the, the, that was some of the, some of the points I was trying to make about, you know, opening up on the diagonal and opening up long dimensions within the house, um, you know, placing uh, the, these mechanical and, and plumbing, the kind of permanent parts of the house wisely more in the center um and um i think uh you know these pocket doors and and stuffing things in walls using walls as as thick storage those rather than making rooms those are all meant to help people think about how to uh, make a, a small house feel bigger but i um I would also say, you know, if it's at all possible to have a balcony or even a wall that that peels away so that the a room feels like it's outside, that that's worth doing. I mean, there must be windows, I would think, mm -hmm. uh, it, um, in every home. <laughs> so there's some kind of connection to the outside. So the, your view, and and even if it's just a, a a balcony that's a couple feet. And I think that's it's also been really driven home by COVID. You know, people who have a, even just a balcony to step out on makes a huge difference for people um, in terms of getting some relief and not feeling trapped inside. So, you know, or skylights. Uh, but I, I do believe that's critical and that everyone has some, must have some way of connecting with the outside. Um, but yeah, those, those, those points of, you know, diagonal, the long axis, the not making rooms that are um, un, un needed, and then multiple use, so that not to think in terms of single use activity, um, single single functions for rooms, but how they can be used uh, differently, you know, at different times of day or times of the year. Building in that flexibility, I think, is, is is key. I mean, when you look at the design of some of these micro apartments, if you've heard about them, um, that's what it's all about. It's all about, you know, furniture that transforms and uh, rooms that transform. And I, mean, I think if you go to Hong Kong, there's a there's a story of, a you know, like a 300 square foot apartment that transforms like a transformer into all these different kinds of spaces. So it's that kind of flexibility, I think, that's, that's really important to um, consider testing out scenarios and making yeah. it more, more, you know, dynamic and not permanent when, if you're really got a small space. Yeah. Great. Um, um, we have two questions that, that uh, two, two questions that, that people have kind of 
second the um, them. So I want to I want to make sure we take both of those. Um, the first one it will um, in no in no particular order is about mortgages and financing for small homes. Have you run into any issues with the banks not wanting to finance smaller homes? Um, it it may depend on where you're building. So, um, yeah, sometimes there, there's a restriction or, or even there's a minimum square footage in some developments. But um, I, I don't really have uh, many stories about that. You know, um, I think um, – I, I, yeah, I can see that, you know, that could be a stumbling block if you've got a bank who want, who's really just seeing things in terms of square footage. But I, but I think that, you know, if you, if you look at um, small, well-designed homes and what they sell for, um, that that could be ammunition with the bank, you know, to say, you know, this is really what people are looking for more and more. And, um, and people more and more are moving into, you know, downtowns and, and dense environments where they have to build small and that's in huge demand. So mm -hmm. I, I think just sort of getting comps and, and referring to well-designed homes that are small and efficient um, sh should be able to, to fight that battle for you or, or, or just go to another bank. <laughs> yeah. And just to, just to validate the question, I mean, I have heard, I've have heard on multiple occasions about people having trouble with this for a number of different reasons from the, from actual square footage requirements of, of, you know, zoning regulations to, um, you know, to, to banks just, you know, being familiar with the idea that you, you maximize the square footage that the lot allows, because that's what gets you the, you know, that's what gets you the highest appraisal value. And that's what they're concerned with. Right. Uh, right. I've never heard of a good solutions for it. So um, anyway, the, yeah. the next, the next question was about ceiling heights. And if you could talk a little bit about how you work with ceiling heights in, in different, you know, size and scale spaces. Mm -hmm. Well, the, um, that, like I was saying that one point of, you know, using a, a lower ceiling height in order to make an eight foot uh, ceiling height feel tall is a kind of um, trick, I guess. Um, if you're trying to, it, it, and it really does work. Um, I did a house for a developer where he would not believe that. And, uh, and it really, he, after we built it, 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 he was really happy. So that, so that does work. And I think that um, ceiling heights are a way and floor heights of defining space in a softer way. So you can get um, a, a lot of differentiation between one space and another through that rather, again, rather than walls. So sort of moving away from walls and trying to define space in a different way. So th that can really uh, be a, a, a nice soft way of, of having a, the coexistence of spaces like dining and living or, um, you know, like m my office nook and the tatami room. It, it, it's just a way to distinguish spaces without having to use solid walls. And, um, it's it's uh, you know I, I think if you have a high space in in a in a small house that's also a really kind of can be very liberating as long as the proportions are correct you know yeah um, but uh, but it's amazing how how you know you really can go low with a ceiling and it's not uncomfortable especially if it's opening onto something bigger. So, and sometimes it's, it's comforting to go into a, a low ceiling space or at an entry or in a bathroom or something. But, but um, uh, you know, I think in, in the, the space in my house, I've got like several seven foot spaces or even lower up in the loft. And it's not um, claustrophobic, but it may be because it's opening onto a bigger common space. Yeah. Um, but I think it's a way to, you know, distinguish spaces and, and add variety. Um, that is not often taken advantage of. Uh, yeah. and, I, and I think also like with ceiling, like if, you, if you're going to differentiate spaces, it's much easier to vary the ceiling height than the floor height. And um, right. I've been called into 
houses, you know, like suburban houses where they feel like everything is just too huge and it's all kind of nondescript space up there. And just by bringing the ceiling height down in different places, you the, the, it just reads completely differently and feels very differently. And you feel, you know, more of an entry and then an arrival and then uh, um, it can tie things together. So it's amazing what you can do with varying the ceiling heights and it's not a very expensive thing to do, just dropping in soffits and in the right places. Yeah, you know, you mentioned Frank Lloyd Wright earlier and I was in the, um, I was not too long ago, I've been, I, I've got, I've, I've been fortunate in my travels to be able to visit a few of his houses, but um, most recent one I was in was at the Crystal Bridges Museum in Bentonville, Arkansas. They, they relocated one of his projects there. And it was really this, um, this really sort of extreme example of that technique of, of compression and, and release in architecture where, right. you know, you walk it, you walk down a hallway where the ceiling is really low and the walls are right at your shoulders. And then it makes that tiny bedroom feel massive when you arrive in it. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> no, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's true. Yeah. It's all it's relative. A, it's wonderful technique. So yeah. we're, we're, we're yeah. at the hour mark um, and, and the questions are slowing down. So, but I want to ask one more, and this is, this is my question. Um, I'm curious about if you could talk a little bit about um, open spaces versus uh, well, less open spaces to say it not so eloquently, but I think a lot of people assume that they want re these really open floor plans. But what I see when I look at your work, and maybe you'll tell me I'm seeing this not, not right, but what I see in your work is a lot of opportunity when the floor plan isn't so open you know, for these little storage spaces, these half walls, or, you know, the, the flexibility of having the half wall with the Soji screen above. So could you speak a little bit about like, what is it, is it, is it more advantageous not to have such big open spaces um, when you're working in a smaller house? Yeah. I mean, usually you won't have the chance to have huge open spaces in a small house, but the, um, I think that, uh, you know, you need to give some kind of human scale definition to spaces. And so, you know, like I've been seeing architecture and design more and more as a stage set, like a prompt, you know, you want to support life in it, but it can't just be this, you know, you gotta, you gotta give prompts. You gotta have suggest where things can happen and uh, invite them to happen. In order for that, you have to sort of anticipate what might happen there. And, uh, but you don't want to define it so rigidly that only that can happen and nothing else could happen. But you, you, so it's sort of a play with the inhabitants and the people who will be there. But you have to uh, define things in terms of certain dimensions, you know, like, like a living room or a dining room or, um, you know, can we fit a ping pong table in there? Or you, know, you test those things out, but you, you have to... Um, define it in a way where you're invited to to inhabit it in those dif those different ways if, it, if it's just a big sort of nondescript openness then people are not uh you know they're it doesn't they aren't invited to do anything there they don't know how, you know it feels like they're floating there's nothing to attach to and so i think it's a real skill to be able to um define things just enough and 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 to make it you know, based on, on typical human use and, um, and, and use those dimensions. So I, I mean, you, but more and more as I've gotten, uh, gone through house design, I think less in terms of this is this, and this is that, and these are the functions, but more just sort of a range of different sizes and dimensions that can be used in different ways. Um, and, uh, and that's been really helpful, you know, like thinking about when all these people, these grandkids come, where can they sleep? So thinking of, of, of the dimension of a bed and sleeping, and then maybe a curtain could be drawn here. And so, I mean, I really love thinking about that kind of flexibility, but sure, you have to um, make these human scale spaces that go from the size of the body up to, um, you know, a big hangout space or a, a big living room. So I, I, yeah, that you're right that that you that it really works much better when um, the the stage set has these uh, human scale prompts that are sort of geared towards typical home use and what happens in a house. Yeah, yeah. 
All right. Well, listen, um, thank you so much for, for yeah. being here tonight. Um, I know you probably, you know, were too busy presenting to, to and, and speaking to look at the chat, but you have lots of appreciation for, um, for your work and, um, and uh, compliments, thank yous. And a lot of, you know, a few people asked if you would come back and do another one. So we definitely want to get you back for, for another webinar soon. Great. Um, and we, we really appreciate it. And, and everyone listening, thank you or watching. Thank you for being here. We appreciate that as well. And this presentation will be um, live as a video on finehomebuilding.com um, within a few days. So if there's, if there's things that you want to look at um, and we can maybe on that page, we can put some links to, to Tina's project. So you'll be able to find it all in one place. So thanks again, everyone. And, and have a wonderful evening. Thanks, Tina. Great. Thanks, Brian. See you later. <laughs>